Chapter 12. The sun had disappeared below the horizon and the beautiful afterglow, which foretold a peaceful night, was flaming across the entire expanse of sky. It was the first evening free from wind or storm that we had experienced in ten days and all were quietly drinking in the magnificent display of color. A quiet sunset on the Gobi can enrapture one into a reverie of forgetfulness of all things. The colors do not glow and shine, they seem to dart here and there in great beams, as though invisible hands were operating colored searchlights. At times it seemed as if these invisible hands were attempting to show the full range of the spectrum and the many variations of color to be obtained in the combinations. A wide band of white light would appear, then branching off at an oblique angle would appear a wide band of violet. From this violet a band of indigo would shoot out and along the side of the indigo a band of blue would appear and so on until the whole atmosphere seemed charged with wide bands of color. Then they would combine and blend again to a band of white, which seemed quite stationary. Again, they flashed out in fan formation, with beams of every color shooting in all directions. This gradually subsided into a solid golden color which caused the undulating sands to appear like a sea of heaving molten gold. This display continued for about 10 minutes, then it faded into a haze of mottled blue, yellow, green, and gray, which seemed to drop from the heavens like a robe of night, and darkness was upon us. So quickly did the darkness surround us that a number of the party expressed startled surprise at its suddenness. The leader of the expedition turned to Bagot Arand and asked if he would give us his version of the people who had inhabited the region and established the cities like the one that lay in ruins below us. He began by saying, we have written records that have been carefully kept from generation to generation for over 70,000 years and these records place the date of the founding of the city, the ruins of which lie below this camp, more than 230,000 years in the past. The first settlers came from the west as colonists many years prior to the founding of this city. These colonists settled in the south and southwest, and as the colonies gradually developed, some of the people moved north and west until they inhabited the whole land. As fertile fields and orchards were established, the colonists laid the foundations for cities. At first these were not large but, as years went by, it was found convenient to gather in these centers for closer fellowship in art and science. Here temples were built, not as places of worship, for the people worshipped every moment by the life they lived. Living was always dedicated to the great cause of life, and while they lived cooperating with the great cause, life never failed them. During this time it was quite common to find men and women thousands of years old. In fact, they did not know death. They passed from one accomplishment to a higher attainment of life and its reality. They accepted life's true source and it released its boundless treasures to them in an unending stream of abundance. But I have digressed, let us go back to the temples. These were places where written records of any attainment in knowledge of the arts, science, and history could be preserved for those who wished to avail themselves of them. The temples were not used as places of worship but as places where the most profound scientific themes were discussed. The acts and the thoughts of worship in those days were carried out in the everyday life of the individual instead of being set aside for a particular group of people or at specified times. They found it more convenient to have broad smooth thoroughfares as means of communication, so they developed what you call paving. They found it convenient to build comfortable homes and, therefore, developed the method of hewing stone and of making brick and the mortar necessary to hold them in place, to fashion their homes and the temples. These things you have already discovered. They found that gold was a most serviceable metal, as it did not tarnish. They found means for collecting it from the sands, then from the rocks, and at last a way to manufacture it, so that it became very common. The people found the way to produce other metals as they were needed and these became plentiful. Then, instead of these communities living by agriculture alone, they began to supply those that tilled the soil with manufactured articles as conveniences for a wider range of operations. The centers grew and developed until they became cities of 1 to 200,000 people. Still they had no temporal heads or rulers, all governing was entrusted to advisory bodies that were selected by the people themselves. Delegations were sent to, and received from, other communities. Yet the people promulgated no laws or rules for the conduct of the individual, as each person realized his own identity and lived by a universal law governing that identity. There was no need for man-made laws, there was need only for wise counsel, then an individual here and an individual there began to wander away. 
At first they were the more dominating souls and they would push on, while those that were inclined to plod would hold back, and unconsciously there came a separation, as the love faculty had not been fully developed by all. The separation grew wider and wider until a very dominating personality set himself up as king and temporal ruler. Since he ruled wisely, the people, with the exception of a few who felt that they could see the future of this separation, acceded to his rule without taking a thought to the future. These few withdrew into communities of their own, and from that time on they lived a more or less secluded life, always attempting to show their fellows the folly of separation. They became the first order of the priesthood, the king established the first order of temporal rulers, and from then on their devious ways may only be followed by deep study and research. There are a few that have preserved the simple teachings and have lived to follow them. But in the main, life has become very complex to the majority. In fact, so complex has it become that they refuse to believe that life is a simple form of living a well-balanced life cooperating directly with the principle of all life. They fail to see that their way of living is the complex and hard way and that the simple life cooperating with the principle of all life is the more abundant life. In this way they must go on until they know a better way. Here the speaker paused, standing silent for a moment, and a picture flashed before our vision. The picture was stationary at first, as has already been described, then it became animated, the forms began to move, and the scenes changed momentarily, or at his direction, as he explained each scene. He seemed to be able to hold or reproduce the scene at will, as questions were asked and answered and explanations given. The scenes were those which were supposed to have been enacted in the ruined city below where we were camped. They did not contrast to any marked degree with scenes of a populous oriental city of today, save that the streets were broad and well kept. The people were well clothed in raiment of good quality, their faces were bright and cheery, and there were no soldiers, paupers, or beggars in evidence. The architecture attracted our attention as the buildings were well and substantially built, and a very pleasing appearance. Although there seemed to be no attempt at display, one temple stood out magnificently beautiful. We were told this temple was built entirely by volunteer hands and was one of the oldest and most beautiful in the land. On the whole, if these pictures were representative, the people must have been contented and happy. We were told that soldiers did not make their appearance until after the second king of the first dynasty had reigned for nearly 200 years. That king, in order to keep up his retinue, began taxing the people, and soldiers were appointed to collect the taxes. In about 50 years, poverty began to show in isolated places. It seems that about this time a portion of the people who were dissatisfied with the kingdom and with those who had assumed the rule, withdrew. Bagot Arand and his people claim the lineal heritage of this race. As the night was well advanced, Bagot suggested that we adjourn and retire, since it would be much pleasanter to make an early morning start. About three hours of the full noonday heat was uncomfortable for travel and the time of winter storms was fast approaching.